This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. As businesses increase in size, many decide to split themselves into divisions. It's extremely common. You get a North American division and a European division. You get maybe a commercial vehicles division and a motor car division. Now, why does this happen? Well, one of the main reasons is specialization. Uh, if you're selling uh, something into America and to Europe and to Asia, in each of those markets, you will be facing very different competitive forces, different competitors. Uh, you'll have to charge different prices. You'll have to advertise differently. Your customers may expect to be handled slightly differently. And even the products may have to be tweaked slightly to suit uh, national tastes or even to comply with the national laws. Uh, and it's much easier if you say, well, you look after the American market, you look after the European market, you look after the Asian market. People specialize, they get to know their market really well. It's always natural. Uh, natural, perhaps, another way of uh, uh, divisionalizing is based on what you do. Uh, so it is uh, quite common to have a manufacturing division uh, and then a selling division. Uh, and the ma manufacturing division has its own skills, its own suppliers, its own techniques, its own type of recruitment and training and uh, health and safety concerns. Uh, whereas the, the selling division is quite separate, could, could indeed be located abroad or certainly geographically uh, separate. And again, it's probably more natural in many ways not to push these together uh, and to insist that they're all under, in a way, one company. And you may get better management coming from really the, the specialization here. How could one manager, uh, for example, uh, be an expert in three or four different markets, be an expert in manufacturing and uh, so on, maybe be an expert in, in, in two radically different products and other basis of divisionalization is in the basis of product streams. Uh, so you could have one division which uh, is making products for the business-to-business uh, -business market, uh, selling to other businesses. They could be uh, products which are maybe got particular properties, particularly strong, uh, uh, styled in a particular way. And another division could be selling products which are uh, aimed at the consumer division. So the styling, the, the pricing and maybe the quality might have to be different. And it also <clears throat> provokes rivalry and within reason rivalry is good provided it doesn't become destructive. Uh, but if you have the uh, divisions competing then it can spur them on to better performance than they might do individually. The downside of divisionalization uh, is that it is possible to have poor coordination uh, between the various divisions uh, and perhaps poor decisions being made. Uh, the worst case of poor coordination that I ever came across uh, was in a, a company which had grown by acquisition. It didn't kind of aim to be divisionalized, but they, it ended up that way. These uh, companies that were bought were kept pretty separate. Uh, and a large government contract came up and two different divisions who didn't know each other were a division of the same uh, group began bidding against the, each other for that contract and they, they just kind of brought the, the price down by rivalry. If this uh, occurs, if these poor decisions uh, occur, uh, then they may often be known as what's called dysfunctional decision making. So dysfunctional decision making. What we want to see as a kind of reverse of dysfunctional decision making is you want goal congruence. <clears throat> and goal congruence means essentially that uh, uh, divisions make decisions uh, which are also good for the group. So the whole thing hangs together quite well. And we start by looking at uh, how you would judge divisions, how you would measure their performance. And there are two methods of uh, measuring uh, performance, or two main me methods of measuring performance uh, in divisions. 
First is the uh, return on investment, which is very like return on capital employed. You take basically the division's controllable profit. And by that we mean the profit uh, after taking off costs that can be controlled by the divisional manager. It wouldn't be very fair if head office imposed lots of costs on a division, uh, reducing its profit, and then you berate the division for having poor profits. It's the controllable profit divided by the capital employed. So we're looking here at the division uh, essentially as an investment centre. We have cost centres where the manager is only concerned with costs. You have uh, profit centres where the manager can look at both costs and revenue. And then finally, the most devolved type of organisation, uh, you have an investment centre where the manager in charge is responsible for the costs, the investment decisions and also the revenue. This is just like return on capital employed and really comes out as a percentage and it shows you for investing this amount of capital in the division what sort of profit it's making out of it. Residual income is a slightly different uh, concept, not as uh, common. But what this is saying uh, really is, look, you're a division, you've made a profit, uh, but I, the head office, I've given you money, I've given you capital, uh, and you haven't really paid any interest on that capital. You haven't paid me for the supplying of that capital. And you say, really, you're being feather bedded. If you are out on your own, not part of a group, and you had to go out into the markets and raise capital, either equity capital or loan capital, uh, that would be coming off your profit. So let's pretend you have to pay for your capital. Uh, and so what we do is you take off a notional interest charge, uh, a pretend charge if you like, uh, and you see what residue of income is left. So residual income is the income that's left after you pay uh, for your share of the capital which has been given to you by the group or by the head office. So let's see uh, a couple of positions uh, here, a couple of uh, examples in this uh, here. This is our uh, starting uh, position. We have a divisional uh, capital of uh, 10 million. We have divisional income there of uh, 1.8 million. And before we do anything else here, we can look at the return on investment uh, for the division as it, as it stands. It's going to be 1.8 million over 10, uh, expressed as a percentage, it's going to be 18%. Uh, the cost of capital is, is usually how head office would decide whether an investment is worthwhile, and head office will be pretty happy with this. Uh, it's uh, happy with investments which return 14%. This particular subsidiary is returning 18%. And indeed, the, the management of this subsidiary or this division would feel pretty safe, uh, a nice healthy margin above what head office requires. The residual income, let's just see that before we go anywhere. Well, they have the divisional capital of 10 million. Uh, and uh, big one, let, let's start again. Residual income, you have the divisional income there of 1.8 million. But as before any charge for the notional interest, then we say, yes, but you are enjoying uh, a capital there of 10 million, and you should really be paying 14% of that as interest. So what we're going to be looking at in there, uh, 1.8 minus 1.4 is 0.4. And provided that's positive, uh, the division is... Uh, economically worthwhile to head office, even after the division has to pretend to pay the uh, rewards to suppliers of capital, it's left with a positive residual income. It's, it's, it's making income over and above just keeping pace with the uh, uh, cost of the capital that it's using. And then what we do is we say the uh, management of this division uh, see in front of them uh, a potential new project. Uh, the additional project is a cost of 2 million and an income of 0.3 after depreciation. And you see that one there, the, the return on that one on its own, 
uh, is going to be 0 0.3 over 2. We're spending 2 million uh, to earn uh, 0.3 million. Uh, and as a percentage, that's going to be 15%. From a group's point of view, this is a worthwhile additional project. Uh, the group only requires uh, projects to uh, give 14%, uh, and any project it finds giving over uh, 14%. So, so far as the group is concerned, uh, it would like this project to be undertaken by the divisional manager. And it won't instruct the divisional manager to do this. That will be interfering with this uh, divisional manager's autonomy. You hope that the divisional manager will make that decision. Uh, so what's, you hope that what's good for the division is good for the group. So let's see what happens if the divisional manager uh, were to take that on. So here uh, is the combined one. This is what we did before the 18%. Uh, and here we're saying, look, we have the old income plus the new income of 0.3. We have the old uh, the um, capital employed plus the new capital employed of 2. Uh, and it's gone down to 17.5. So what the divisional manager sees here is a decrease. And, and the thought is, why would a divisional manager volunteer to take on a project which seem to reduce the apparent performance of the division uh, that was being looked after. This divisional manager will have to now put in some sort of performance report and explain why uh, the return on investment in the division has gone down half a percent. Uh, and so this divisional manager will be very tempted to say no to this investment, keep their return on investment high at 18%. Of course, head office needn't even know uh, about this, this incremental investment, the divisional manager just kind of keeps it quiet. The divisional manager might know that head office would like it, but the divisional manager is looking after his or her own position, uh, not creating any dips in the performance measures. When the same is done with residual income, this was the original one here, we had the capital less 10% uh, being on the income, less 10% of the capital, in there, for the income less 14% of the capital uh, there. Uh, then we had the divisional income of residual income of 0.4 that was left. Now when they take on the uh, new project, we're getting 18 plus 0.3 as we had in here. Uh, and now the uh, charge of the capital is going to be 14% of 12. And now we see here there's an increase. So whereas here the divisional manager would refuse the investment to the down, here the divisional manager will take up the investment uh, and will be keen to do it. Uh, the outcome of this really is that residual income is going to lead you to goal congruent decisions. The risk with residual income, uh, big one, the risk with, with return on investment, there's a risk, it's not obviously guaranteed, uh, there's a risk of non-goal congruent. Decisions. And that's one of the uh, particular drawbacks with return on investment. It's obvious, people feel comfortable with the return on investment and so on. Uh, residual income is a, is a little bit uh, more specialized. People aren't quite as familiar with it and so on. Uh, but nevertheless, for goal congruence, it's going to be better. Let's look at the uh, comparisons uh, uh, here. So, uh, uh, both favor older divisions. What do we mean by both favoring older divisions? Well, if you think about the capital employed in a company uh, and you think of something which is depreciating. So let's say we had a, a single asset in a company, in, in a division, I mean, uh, which was 12 million. Uh, and that's going to be uh, equal to really the capital employed. And it's going to have a life of four years. 
Well, you're depreciating it over four years. Uh, the next year, uh, the capital employed is going to go from 12, and then we're going to have a depreciation of that of 3, down to 9, down to 6, down to 3, and so on. Every year that goes past, the net book value of this asset goes down, the capital employed in the division appears to go down. Uh, so when you go to look at the return on investment, so the return on investment was basically the income over the capital employed. If this is going down, then of course this is going to go up. Uh, and as it goes up, it makes the divisional manager look quite good. Every year the residual, that big one, the return on investment will be going up uh, just because the assets are getting older. Uh, so if we had two divisions identical except for the age of the assets uh, and one was uh, labouring under capital employed of uh, 12 and one that was two years old and only capital employed of six, then it's going to be much easier for the manager of the older division to look good. It'll also be a great disincentive to modernise. As soon as you modernise, your capital will go up again to the 12 and your return on investment will go down. This is also a problem uh, with your uh, residual income because the residual income uh, which you have, it is a, an interest charge based on the capital employed. So your residual income is equal to the income minus uh, the cost of capital times the capital employed. So that stays constant, this stays constant but the capital employed, again on this example, is going to be 12 in the first year, 9, 6, etc. This keeps going down, uh, so this will keep going up. So again, even uh, with residual income, uh, just by doing nothing every year, because your, your capital base is going down, uh, your notional interest charge will go down, your residual income will go up. There's also uh, some uh, difficulties of some of the divisions uh, had uh, a lot of leased assets, uh, particularly uh, uh, operating leases, uh, which aren't really going to appear on the statement of financial position. Uh, in an extreme situation, you could have a division almost making goods with no real visible non-current assets uh, at all. Uh, and of course, it's going to be making lots of goods by paying you know, the lease charges. There, it's going to be making income but its return on capital is going to be quite high because the capital employed is very low because it's all its assets are leased. However, a nearly identical division in terms of the assets which buys its assets has its statement of financial position kind of stuffed full of non-current assets, very apparent high uh, uh, capital employed. Return on investment, uh, the good things about that is it seems familiar, we're happy with return on capital employed and so on. You can compare it to a company target. So we were doing that. Uh, we said the company cost of capital was 14%. We were coming in at 18%. We were jolly happy there. It's very good at uh, uh, divisions of different sizes here because what you're doing is you're taking the income over the capital employed. Uh, so if a division uh, simply doubles in size, or you're comparing two divisions uh, of different sizes, if one has income of um, uh, 20, uh, and uh, let's say there's capital employed of 50, uh, then it's coming out at uh, what, 20%. Uh, if you had one which was kind of twice as big, uh, then and if everything was, was going just as well, then of course it would be 20%. So the managers of each division are kind of being judged on how well you're making use of the capital employed. And it encourages the maximization of a company ROI. If, if investors are looking at the company's return on capital employed, then if each of the divisions is encouraged to maximize its return on investment, you will automatically be maximizing the company's uh, return on capital employed. But as we say, uh, as we saw in the previous slide here, there is a, a real chance that opportunities may be lost through dysfunctional decision making, where the manager sees ROI going down, decides not to go that route, even though it would have been quite good for the 
uh, the group. Return uh, on investment has got those advantages and disadvantages. Now looking at residual income here, we know it is uh, uh, likely uh, that we're going to get better goal congruent decisions. Uh, what's good for the group will show an increase in residual income in the division. Uh, and what we can do also is you can apply different notional interest rates to different divisions. So the divisions might be in different operations. And if you think one of the divisions is in a riskier sort of an operation than the other, then you can apply a kind of risk adjusted discount rate. You, you can charge it more for its use of interest or use of capital than a, a division which is in a safer uh, type of uh, area of business. The disadvantages, it's uh, unfamiliar, not as familiar as return on uh, capital employed or return on investment. And you need to be careful, it's no good really for comparing diff divisions of different sizes. If division A uh, had a return or a residual income rather uh, of equal to say 10 and division B had a return on investment, a big one, residual income, uh, of let's say 30. Uh, you can't say that division uh, B is, or the manager of division B is better than the manager of division A. It could simply mean that division B is three times as big. So you've got three times the income, three times the notional interest charge, you're going to end up there uh, with uh, three times the residual income. So comparing divisions of different sizes, we don't know what is really better performance or what is really a function of size. Uh, another method we're going to look at very uh, briefly here that uh, can look at the appraisal of divisions is economic value added uh, here. With uh, economic uh, value added, it's very similar to uh, uh, residual income uh, here. What you do is you take the net, op net operating profit after tax, uh, the, the X say, uh, and you subtract from this the weighted average cost of capital times the value of the capital employed. Okay, So it's a bit like income over your uh, notional interest in here. You're charging the profit after tax with the uh, uh, cost of the capital which is employed. There are many other adjustments to be looking at uh, here that come out. This is a, a method which has actually got a, a trademark associated with it. It was uh, developed by a particular firm of investment analysts uh, and they had about 160 uh, different kind of adjustments you would do, which we'll just look at very briefly uh, here. But what they said was uh, uh, you should add back uh, some costs which uh, would normally be written off in the profit and loss account. You should add back research and development expenditure and marketing costs. They view research and development expenditure as an investment for the future and indeed marketing costs as well. And if uh, you were to be deducting these from profits, even though it might be very prudent to do so, you might be encouraging people to cut back on research and development to keep their profits high and make the division look good for a little while. So there's going to be no penalty really in your profit and loss for investing for the future. Goodwill written off, you add back to net profit as well. They say this, these adjustments are terribly arbitrary. Depreciation is very arbitrary. They replace that by something which is called economic depreciation. Any provisions are added back because provisions go up, provisions go down. They're subject to manipulation potentially by management that in a way uh, precautionary costs, not necessarily real uh, costs. You add back leased capital uh, so that we get no real differences between the capital employed in, a, in a, a, a company which owns its assets and the capital employed in a company which leases its assets. Uh, and interest and death capital is added back because we're looking at the profit before interest uh, and charging that with uh, rewards to all suppliers of capital for the weighted average cost of capital. Transfer pricing. Inevitably, uh, almost inevitably, when you've got two divisions and you, you transfer goods from one to the other, uh, 
then uh, you will have to decide how we're going to look after really the bookkeeping as we transfer goods uh, from one to the other. And it's normal for uh, some sort of almost internal invoice to be raised uh, to show value being sold by one division that can be bought in by the other division. You certainly need it for uh, accountability. You need to know where the inventory is. So there has to be some sort of uh, transfer of value. Uh, you also need it really for performance measurement. Uh, how do you know how well maybe the selling division is doing if you're not actually charging it for goods coming up from the group? It seems to be selling goods, getting loads and loads of revenue for hardly any cost because they've been kept in another division. And controversially at the, the moment, uh, we have uh, taxation minimization. Many uh, large, particularly high tech companies uh, seem to be shifting their profits around through different countries through transfer pricing uh, so that they remove profits from countries with relatively high tax uh, and shift those profits to countries with relatively low tax. What we like to see in a good transfer price uh, here is profits for each division because profits are motivating. It's nice for managers to aim at a profit rather than to be kept to a cost target. We like goal congruence. In other words, we want the transfer prices to be such that it gets the divisions to make the right decisions that are good for the group. We like autonomy. Uh, and autonomy means that uh, the we're not interfering with the divisions. We're not telling them what to do. We set a transfer price and let them get on with it here. Uh, and the other thing I'll just put in here, they, they ought to be fair, uh, particularly here when we're, we're looking at performance uh, measurement. Uh, divisional managers can get very kind of irritated uh, if they think uh, another division is buying materials in on the cheap from them, that another division is getting a, a, an easy ride whilst they're finding it really hard to make profits. So let's uh, have a work through a number of examples on uh, uh, transfer pricing. Uh, the, the methods that are potentially at our disposal are these, cost plus. So in the transferring division, you add, let's say, 20% onto the cost. Market prices are, are, are this could be a little bit arbitrary. Uh, there's a danger also that if you're doing cost plus, uh, uh, why save costs? So if you're a division, you're transferring to another division, you said, right, you will be getting cost plus 25%. The higher your costs, the higher will the 25% be, the higher your profit will be. Uh, and there's a very good argument for here, if you are going to be doing cost plus, make a cost plus maybe on the standard costs. So you make your profit based on the standard costs. If you over uh, go on the costs, if you have too many costs, you know, an adverse cost variance really, that cost variance is going to be left with you. All you can pass on to the next division is standard costs plus a profit. And in a way, of course, they are starting from a clean slate as well. They're not inheriting your inefficiencies. Uh, market prices are fine uh, if there is one. So it implies that the components going from one division to the other, that the intermediary products, as we call it here, has actually got a market. But the great thing uh, here is it's perceived as being very fair. Because you can say to each of the divisions, look, if you're on your own, not part of a group, and you were selling outside to third party suppliers, uh, third party customers, you will be selling at the market price. And you can sell, say to the second division, look, if you're on your own having to buy in these components from a competitive market, you'll be paying the market price. So neither of you can come kind of complaining to me that one or other party is being feather bedded. Marginal cost is uh, quite good uh, for um, goal congruence. Because as uh, items go up through the group, they, they always just are transferred at the marginal cost so far. The end division has got a very good uh, view of kind of marginal cost versus marginal revenue and so on. 
The bad thing about it, however, there's no profit. If a, a company, uh, a division, transfers out at marginal cost, it will be left bearing the fixed costs. It's not a, a deal breaker, but we said it's quite nice if you can give each of the divisions some profit because it's motivating to aim towards a profit. To get round that, uh, you have marginal cost plus lump sum. What this means is that during the, uh, the year, you transferred marginal costs, so you've got quite good economic information going up through the division. And then at the end of the year, you do a series of journal entries, really, between the divisions, where you transfer some more uh, money uh, from the buying division to the selling division, and this lump sum really is for the profit. So what you're trying to do is to separate out uh, here different elements of the transfer price. Marginal cost during the year, everybody knows what the proper cumulative marginal cost is in the group, and you need really marginal cost to make good economic decisions. Then at the end of the year, they get their reward, uh, which is going to give them a bit of profit, which would encourage them, of course, uh, to sell more units. If you're only getting marginal cost, uh, you're not going to do any better by selling more units to the other division. Uh, you're just kind of standing still. You're still going to be just bearing your fixed cost. But if the lump sum was in some way geared to the volume of units you transferred up through the group, then there's everything to play for. Dual prices are a curious one. Uh, dual prices would be if, let's say, your division A selling to division B. Uh, then uh, here the, the selling price is 25, uh, but here maybe the buy-in price is 20. So what you've got in here is maybe some profit. And what you've got there is maybe just a marginal cost. And of course, it's going to uh, play havoc with your uh, current accounts between these two divisions. It'll have to be sorted out by the time you come around to publish accounts. But as far as A is concerned, it's selling at 25, it's making a profit, it'll be incentivized to keep costs down and to sell more and so on. So far as B is concerned, it's just buying in stuff at 20. Uh, it will have proper marginal cost type information to make the right economic decisions. And then we have uh, negotiated or imposed. Negotiated maybe between the divisions, which can, uh, can be quite difficult. Uh, but quite often, the head office will come in and say, right, this is going to be the transfer price. I've worked it out to be a good transfer price, but this is all I'm going to do. The only place I'm going to interfere with you is to set this transfer price. So let's look at uh, some uh, examples uh, here. So we have uh, Division A uh, has costs of 20, transfers to Division B, additional costs of 8. Division B sells externally at 30 uh, dollars. The company has a policy of setting a transfer price at, uh, uh, at cost plus uh, 20%. So you always need a little diagram really for uh, transfer pricing. So the goods are going like that from division A to division B. You will have your transfer in cost and the transfer in cost for A is nothing because it's the start of the chain. Uh, and then you have your own costs. And the own costs in Division B, A, a big one is 20. So 20. And then we have the, the markup. And we're told here the company has a policy of set setting transfer prices at cost plus 20% there. So we have four in there. And then this goes up here, and this becomes the buy-in price up there. Division B has additional costs uh, of 8. Uh, this is going to be coming up uh, here to uh, 32. And then it's selling externally at 30. Now that's not going to work. I think you can see that's not going to work. Uh, because if this, this whole manufacturing is going to be viable, uh, really, 
both parties uh, making their own decisions, A and B were making their own decisions here, uh, they will have to find it financially worthwhile. And here, Division B would simply say, I'm not going to play this game. Why would I uh, incur costs? Because both of these costs are kind of being debited to Division B. Uh, why would I incur costs for 32? And these are marginal costs. Uh, every extra unit is causing costs of 32, only to get income of 30. And they would say, no, it will not work. So Division B wouldn't play ball here. You need both parties to be willing to play the game. Let's change it a little bit. Uh, let's say instead of selling externally at, at 30, Division B can actually sell at 36. So we're now going to have a 6 in here. Uh, and instead of making a loss in here, a big pun, uh, I think I did the previous one wrong. Uh, and instead of making the uh, the loss in there of two, uh, we're going to 36 here. We're going to have the profit in here of four. That's, that's what I wanted to, the way I wanted it to be to be set out uh, there. And this is going to outside. So 20% added on here. Selling price outside now 36, uh, and they're both making profits. That will work. Uh, both divisions will be keen uh, on dealing with these goods because each of them perceives a profit of four. They might even think it's fair that the overall profit for the company and the overall profit for the company, well, the, the real cost to the company are 28. Uh, the real income to the company is 36. The actual company profit available is eight, and that's just going to be carved up in different ways, depending on what the transfer price is going to be. Now, we said that both parties need to play ball here. Uh, and uh, A, the transferring division here, uh, A here, this will be the one which is going to uh, be determining the minimum transfer price. And if you look at A, A is doing these sums. It says I've got costs of 20. Uh, if I had a transfer price not of 24 but of 19, I'd be making a loss of one. I wouldn't play ball there. I think you can see maybe that the absolute minimum transfer price, or the transfer price is going to be working here, uh, it has to be kind of greater or, or equal to 20, the marginal cost of production in A. If the transfer price was 20, there's nothing in it for A, it's making nothing, but at least it's not making a loss. Anything above 20 will help Division A uh, to make more contribution to help cover its fixed costs. Division B, the other side, this is the one that's going to be really looking at the maximum transfer price. And a very good concept in the maximum transfer price is to look at what's called the net marginal revenue. And the net marginal revenue, Division B will say, right, every unit I sell, I get 36. Every unit uh, I make, I have my own costs in here of 8. So there's 28. After I cover my own costs, I'm making 28. Uh, and provided my buy-in price is not greater than 28, so we're saying here the maximum transfer price, we're really looking for less than or equal to 28 in here, uh, there's something in it for B. So if the transfer price were 27, you would have uh, 27 uh, plus 8, you'd have 35, you'd still be making 1. But if it went up to 29, you'd have 29 plus that would be 37, you'd be making a minus 1 and there, you wouldn't do it. So the range of operating transfer prices here is between 20 and 28. Anything outside those ranges, no trade, no transfer will take place at all. On the 20 and the 28, one or other party isn't going to be terribly happy, but at least it's not making a loss. Inside the range of 20 to 28, 
both parties will trade. There's eight uh, available from profit, and all that the transfer price that set does is this kind of shift round which of the divisions enjoys the profit. The higher the transfer price, the more of the profit will go to A, uh, the less to B. The lower the transfer price, the more of the A profit will be split into A, uh, and so on. But we have a viable range. So the transferring division, the selling division, determines the minimum transfer price. The buying division is going to be determining the maximum transfer price. So let's uh, let's get a little bit more complicated uh, here. So again, our diagram here will, will it's always going to be the same. We have your your own costs, your transfer costs in here. So transfer costs and own. So here we have division A, which is own cost of 15. So it's the first in the, the line. It is no uh, transfer in, so it's 15. Be a bit of profit that we don't know yet. And then transfer, transfer price. This will go up to kind of in there. Division B has additional cost of 10. We don't know what that is. Uh, and division B selling externally uh, at 35. So this is going to the uh, the public. Uh, and also here we are opening up the possibility that division A uh, can sell partially finished units at 20. So as well as selling outside a transfer price here, it could also kind of go outside here or outside at 20. And it's important here that uh, A has unlimited production capacity and that is limited demand from the external customers for the A, the intermediate product. So here you are, the manager of A, you're in the driving seat, uh, so to speak. You see two sources of revenue. You can sell outside at 20, or you can sell up through the group at whatever the transfer price is. Now see what would happen uh, if we put a transfer price here. We may change this in a moment. Uh, let's say of 17. So you see I can either sell outside at 20, or up through the group at 17, uh, and you would rather sell outside at 20. You're making more profit selling outside at 20 than you are selling up through the group at 17. So you would be deflecting all of your production outside. And this is where the capacities become important. There's limited demand from A, and we can make as much as is demanded. So we sell, sell, sell outside at 20, uh, and then we've satisfied that market entirely. And then we can turn our attention to the, the second best market. We will uh, be able then to keep supplying Division B with more product because we have unlimited production. And if we were offered 17 from uh, Division B as a transfer price, we would do it. Uh, the, the minimum, I think you can see the minimum transfer price in here for A is going to be 15. Provided the transfer price up here is at least 15, uh, we are not going to be making a loss. 17 will make us 2, 18 will make us 3, uh, but, but at, at 14 will make us a loss. So the minimum transfer price we'll be willing to countenance in making and selling to B is going to be 15. In B, the maximum Looking to maximum uh, that, that B would be willing to uh, undertake, you've got revenue of 35, you've got costs of 10, uh, 25. The, this is a net marginal revenue. So provided the transfer price was not more than 25, uh, then B could still make a profit. Uh, it, oh, well, nothing was on 25, but, it, but if the uh, the transfer price was 26, say, 
then of course you'd be making a loss. If the transfer price was 24, uh, 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 34, you're making a little bit of a profit. So the, 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 the transfer price is on the edge is this net marginal revenue again. And here the range is going to be 15, 25. A would first sell maybe outside, depending what the transfer price was, maybe sell outside, uh, and then it would turn its attention uh, to uh, selling units to B. Now let's see what happens if this uh, changes, is this uh, uh, relative demand and relative production capacity changes. It has changed, it changed here. Uh, it says there's limited uh, 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 it should be unlimited, I should say, unlimited demand externally from A, and is limited production capacity uh, uh, that, that can be made in A. So it's unlimited demand outside, uh, and limited production capacity is what we want in this. So A, B. So we have division A has got costs of 15, so we have own costs, we have transfer price, own costs, nothing in there. 15, that's as before. 15. It can still sell externally at 20 to a market which will absorb everything because it's unlimited demand externally from A. There'll be a transfer price, there'll be a bit of a profit in there. Let's go up around in here. Uh, whatever that is, so we have the additional cost here of 10. And we don't know what that is, can what the profit is, and it's selling outside of 35. Public. Now what we have to do is we have to work out what would we like, uh, what would the group like them to do? Uh, and the group in a way has got two potential sources of uh, profit. Uh, for every item that A makes and sells outside, we call that the A profit, it can sell outside at 20, uh, uh, it can costing it 15. For every unit that A makes and sells outside, the group makes 5, and A makes 5. What is the group profit? Uh, so if uh, we have a, an article which is, first of all, made in A, transferred to B, and then sold outside at 35, well, the group will be earning revenue of 35, and the cumulative costs in the uh, the, the group in, in here, minus 15 in here, minus 10 there, is going to be 10. So the group can make 5 if A sells a product. The group can make 10 if essentially B sells a product, if it goes up through B. And of course, the group will be very keen on that happening making much better profits by uh, components going up through the group being finished off and being sold as the ultimate product. So what we have to do uh, is we have to ensure that happens. Uh, and the manager in the driving seat is A. A is deciding whether to sell outside at 10, uh, a big one at 20, or, or whether to transfer inside uh, up through the group. A knows it can make five by selling outside directly. So the transfer price that we're offering it must be at least as good as five. It must be a kind of competing transfer price. If we put a transfer price in here of 21, that will allow six to be made in here. And, 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 and 21 beats 20. A would prefer to to send stuff up through the group, which is exactly what the group wants. If we had a transfer price in here of, say, only 19, uh, then of course A will see uh, what do we have in there? Uh, it's going to be 4. A will see a profit of 5 going this way and 4 going the other way. The transfer price doesn't compete very successfully. And remember here, uh, the, this external demand at 20, it will take as much as A can make, uh, but A has itself limited production capacity. So, so what's going to happen here is A will just keep sending stuff outside. 
A, will have got up to its limited production capacity and there'll be nothing left to send up through B. So here really the minimum transfer price that will make things work is going to be 20. 20 gives them a profit uh, of 5, gives A a profit of 5, but also it, it gives at least as good a profit as selling outside. Uh, it's tempting now to at least consider selling up through the group, which is what the group wants. The maximum transfer price is just as it's before. It's going to be the 35 minus the 10 is going to be 25. We have to make sure that transfer price is not over 25, otherwise B won't play the game. Uh, B will see uh, that there's no positive contribution in for it. I like to think of this as a, a kind of competing transfer price. Uh, quite often you'll see in uh, texts and so on uh, that really the minimum transfer price is equal to marginal cost plus the opportunity cost of, non of, the, of the transfer. So the marginal cost of production in A is 15. And if we decide not to transfer out to the external market, we're losing some profit. That's the opportunity cost. And what we're losing is 20 minus 15. We need a kind of compensation to make us go up through the group there. And of course, it just comes back to 20. So you can think of it either way uh, here. A must get a compensation to make it worthwhile not to sell out through the intermediate market to make it worthwhile to sell up through the group. Final uh, example uh, we, we have here, I think, yep, uh, is uh, now A and B again, but this time it's B which can bring in from outside, so A and B. So we have transfer price, we have costs. I think the figures have changed in this one. So division A here is costs of eight, no transfer. Uh, it was going to be selling to you know, a little bit of profit in here. Uh, going to be a transfer price up here. Going to go up through like this. Uh, division B is additional cost of four, and it can sell outside at twenty to public. I think that's it. Now what happens if Division B can buy in part finished goods externally at 14? So now Division B is a choice to make. It can buy in at whatever this transfer price is, or in number one here, it can buy in at 14. Again, you go back and say, well, what would the group like Division B to do? Uh, but B is, is buying in components either way. It's either buying in components from outside or it's buying in components from Division A. Uh, the cost to the group of buying components from Division A is really only 8. That's the cost incurred in Division A. Uh, but here, if it buys from outside, it incurs costs to the group of 14. And quite obviously the group wouldn't want that that the group would not want B to decide to buy at 14 from outside. This is going to be very expensive uh, when it really only costs the group 8 to make these units. The minimum transfer price here isn't really affected, so the minimum is not, not really is going to be 8. Remember, it's a selling division which is going to be uh, determining the minimum transfer price, it has to be at least eight to cover these variable costs in here. But the maximum transfer price uh, here, where we've got net marginal revenue of 22, uh, theoretically uh, anything up to 22 will make B buy in. But we 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 want we we want to make sure that the the buy in price here is at least com competitive with 14. Uh, if we put a, a transfer price here of 15. B sees I can buy at 15 or I can buy at 14. It will buy at 14, which is good for it, but not good for the group. Uh, if this was only down at 13, then 
Division B says I can buy in at 13 from the group or in 14 from outside, it will decide to buy from the group, which is what we want. So here, the maximum transfer price uh, here in this particular uh, example uh, is going to be the buy-in price from outside. The buy-in price from outside. Uh, provided the transfer price is no greater than 14, then B will be perfectly happy to buy in from the group uh, and this is what the group wants and we're making a profit and, and B can make a profit at this at this 14 here we'll have own cost of 18 is still a 2 available there if however the buy-in price was 18 uh, the rule changes very slightly there's no point in setting uh, now a transfer price equal to 18 because 18 plus 4 is going to give you 22 B won't want to play there uh, the net marginal revenue uh, is only uh, 20 minus 4 is only 16 there so here the the maximum transfer price that would work is 16 18 is out of the the, 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 the the running entirely B would never buy in from outside at 18 no matter what the transfer price was because 18 plus 4 22 you've got no hope of making a profit in there if you're going to sell to the public so 18 is kind of a bit irrelevant now but B will still be wanting to make a profit on transferring from B so we're back to net marginal revenue it's going to be net marginal revenue is equal the revenue we get from selling outside minus 4 is going to be 16. The rules such as it's worthwhile learning rules here uh, and I many ways would advise you maybe not to learn rules so much uh, as to think about it logically uh, but there are rules the minimum transfer price uh, which you have is determined by the transfer or the seller it must uh, first of all cover its marginal costs and then if there are alternative ways you can sell the product if you want it to be going up through the group you must offer it a compensation for what's losing by selling outside or just a transfer price which competes successfully with the outside prices the maximum transfer price is determined by the transferee or the buyer uh, and it is the lower of the net marginal revenue in other words, we have to see profit to start with, otherwise we will simply not deal if we can't see a positive contribution coming in and the external buy-in price. So it has to be at least no higher than the external buy-in price if we want them to buy from the group and not to buy in from outside. International uh, aspects uh, which we've got uh, here just very briefly to look at taxation I've mentioned already uh, shifting uh, profits around by manipulating transfer prices to get the profits ending up in uh, low tax regimes remittance of profits some countries are uh, reluctant to let subsidiaries remit dividends effectively remit profits to uh, holding companies in another country they say your subsidiaries in our country it's made profits out of our people we want this money to stay in our country we won't let you pay dividends uh, so what you can do uh, within reason is to sell them components at a relatively high price and they're basically paying for purchases uh, which most countries allow and it's going to be reducing the profits that may be remittable there are quotas and tariffs uh, around the place which may uh, uh, interfere with intercompany transfers or uh, alter effectively the transfer price by adding a tariff on. You need to look at exchange rate uh, considerations and you need to make sure that if you're exporting to a country uh, that by the time you've taken the transfer price into account and the costs and so on in that country uh, that the uh, product which is going to be selling in your subsidiary in another country is actually competitive uh, with what products made in that country uh, are actually going to be uh, uh, big selling at. So the transfer price has to keep them competitive.